And on. If you go to that website, join.me and put that number in your website, you'll actually be able to see in front of you at your laptop screen exactly what I'm presenting here. So I'm broadcasting this out to that number. It's an extremely useful little tool that, uh, in terms of presenting and having large rooms. Are we time already? Are you late? I'm almost there. All right, perfect. So we're just closing the doors. So uh, for those of you who want to, that's the number. It should be at the top of it. Uh, if somebody doesn't remember it, go ahead and ask the person next to you and eventually continue to ask the person next to you. Eventually it'll come up to me and I'll tell you. So, uh, another quick note before I get started, because it always distracts people while I'm presenting, um, but it's an extremely useful tool while I present. You saw if I went like that and I very quickly zoomed and I could kind of click and draw around the screen and do things. It's a program called... Uh, oh, Oh, that's too much. Come on. There we go. Sorry about that. You can see it. Okay, you can see that. Okay. I'm not doing a good job kind of showcasing that. All right. So, look at this. You can go ahead and search for that afterwards. It's the tool. I do not have Zoom in LabVIEW, contrary to popular belief. It's just a handy dandy little tool that I use to help me present and show things so that everybody in the back, like Mr. Dickens and Mr. Crowell, can go ahead and see some of the things that I've got up on the screen a little bit easier. So, that being said, let's get started. Good afternoon. Thank you all for showing up today. My name is Norm Kirshner. I'm an RF systems engineer here at National Instruments. And I'm going to talk to you today about the rebirth, or what I call the rebirth, of the LabVIEW state machines. Yes? You're ringing. I'm ringing. Okay, let me go ahead and move down. Is that any better? Still ringing. Still ringing? Still ringing? Still ringing? Can you still hear me in the back? Yes. I'll just continue to talk very loud. Okay. Uh, Although I'm an RF systems engineer here at National Instruments, I've been a LabVIEW programmer since 2000, and that is my passion through and through amongst a variety of other things. But when it comes down to LabVIEW and my daily job, I love to create reusable architectures and tools so that I don't waste time doing stuff that I've already done. So, very simple question. How does one identify a bird? Now this is a question that probably seems very orthogonal to what we're talking about today. But it was an interesting question that a friend of mine posed to me about a year ago. And it seemed like a very puzzling question for somebody to ask someone, how do you identify a bird? And I looked outside of the tree and I went, bird. <laughs> and I thought that that made sense. Uh, little did I know she was talking about the very specific bird uh, that uh, I was trying to identify. But after thinking about that, it led me to the software discussion of, well, how do you, does one identify a bird? You look at its characteristics. You know, what does it look like? What is its foot webbing? What kind of activity does it fly? What is its song? And those individual things help you identify something else. Now in graphical software, we have a very similar uh, kind of paradigm. How do we identify things in software? How do we know what something is simply by looking at it? Well, luckily with LabVIEW, we don't actually have to go through and read text, a lot of uh, uh, lines and lines of text code to kind of develop it. And even text, uh, textual-based languages, in terms of system modeling, have gone down the path of, you know, for a while now, actually, showing their architectures in a graphical representation. So how do we identify what some of these things are? What can we identify this as? Somebody, quick, first hand up, you get a prize. <laughs> State machine. State machine, excellent, excellent answer. The answer is my undying appreciation for the person who raised their hand first. <laughs> so, uh, what do we see up here? What characteristics can we tell that this program has? This is represented as a start. This is represented as the end of the program. These are, as we've probably all figured out, our states of the program, and then there are transitions leading between them. Now, based on the individual uh, uh, more details of this that we can't tell just by this picture, we would actually be able to see uh, or be able to tell more about this. The uh, funny thing is that more, there are different types of state machines that exist out there, finite state machines in particular. There's a definition of a Mealy state machine, or a Moore state machine, or uh, in five, there's a variety of them. I saw them all on Wikipedia, didn't even write them down. Too busy making this a good presentation for y'all. So, we know that this is a state machine, but we don't know all the things about it. Can anybody tell me what this is? <laughs> Anna, come on, somebody, wake up, end of the day. Oh, there we go. Producer consumer, yes. This is a standard model that more and more beginner LabVIEW developers are starting to work with. 
This used to be something that you waited for a long time to have somebody finally show you, and you're like, oh, that makes all my programs extremely easy to write. Now, all of us here are either NI employees or Alliance members, and so we've got hopefully some level of savviness with LabVIEW. But this is very often, so we've been seeing this for a while, but for our beginner users, this is what people are you know, kind of just getting running out of the box. Great thing, right? Great thing that now the programs are no longer stacked sequence structures where somebody gets run continuously. Who here has seen an application where somebody actually developed their entire program like that? You know, one. Oh, little bits of my soul just died. This, though, however, my friends, is not a state machine. This is a way to implement an application. But this is not a state machine. And this has caused one big, huge gaping problem that we have all lived with for a long time. And so many of you would say, what's wrong with my programs? How dare you say my thing uh, is not a state machine? Well. My program works fine. You know, these are all things that might be going through your heads right now in terms of, I've developed my program, so how can you tell me that my thing isn't a state machine or that there's issues? It's because you know how to walk across your own bridge. You know that you go, <laughs> and you get across, safe. I've been doing it for 20 years. What's wrong with me doing it this way? Well, the problem always ends up being, what about the person that hasn't been doing it? What about the tourist that ends up on the bridge next to it over there? Like that one, this is the world's most dangerous bridge in Pakistan. So it's really good players. And so very often as we develop our applications, based off of what we call the, and in heavy, heavy quotes, the lab use state machine, which it is not, um, we end up doing this very thing. And I'd like to show you, courtesy of Dave Snyder, also Daklu on the forums if you know him, an example that highlights this and hopefully drives it straight home so you believe it. program I'm going to run is this. The purpose of this program is when I hit the start button, it's going to go one, two, three, four, five. Every time I hit the start button, it's going to go one, two, three, four, five. Anything that's not that is a bug. Right? Very simple bug. One, two, three, four, five. I've done my walk across my bridge, no problem. One, two, three, four, five. Everybody's happy. So the next person walks down, they oh, I'm sorry, I'm hiding this. Somebody just you know, say, you're hiding the screen, though. Please move. Okay. So if you didn't see that, so any savvy labby program, like most of us are out there, realize, oh, there's a problem in the program. Well, let's go ahead and look at the code. Well, you hit the start button, state one comes in, and then state two gets enqueued from state one, and so on and so forth. For those of you who can't see, we're just kind of taking that idea. Come on. There we go. That's what's going to do. So an individual state enqueues the next one. So what's happening in the program? Well, somebody's enqueuing one in the process, and so things get out of order. All right, so the savvy lab you programmer very likely goes, well, I'm going to go ahead and fix that one. I don't need to worry about that. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and instead, I'm going to go ahead I'm going to have a macro. So when I hit the button, it's going to invoke this macro. And that way, nobody can get in between my individual actions. I fix the bugs. My program's got no problems here, right? Nope, go ahead and run it. Start. I hit start again. Hey, finished. And it went one, two, three, four, five. But wait, I hit start twice. Because somebody, oh, wait, two, three. Got another bug in the program. Once again, we've probably all run into this situation. I'm going to keep going through on this path, even though I'm sure you've all kind of figured out how to solve all this in your heads. <laughs> So, instead of now doing it at the beginning, I'm just going to go ahead and say, you know what? I'm going to enqueue them all up front. That way, I always do one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And it will go through no matter what I do and when I click it, it's going to continue going. My program is now bug free, no problems whatsoever, right? <laughs> well, now that I've clicked it 20 times and I hit stop, 
Well, now I've got to wait until I execute that thing 20 times before it stops, because all those individual actions have now been queued up in there. Now, the program still hasn't failed, but now I'm pretty much stuck and there's no other thing. So effectively, somebody's asked for a feature. How often do our customers ask for a feature, right? They only give us the specifications once and they're solid, right? Good. I'm glad you're all laughing. Yeah, I wish. You know, it shouldn't be a pipe dream, but unfortunately it is. If we're expecting the specification, I do not know what it means. Yes, the word specification, I do not know what it means, was what he had said. Okay, so. So all of you have figured out, well, we've got a bunch of things in this action queue. So let's just go ahead and cram something at the front of the queue by using the insert at opposite end, right there, right? Makes sense? The program will stop automatically. So now, so I haven't changed anything else in the program. These things are only changing one step at a time. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, clicking it you know, 100,000 times. I go ahead and hit stop and my program stops. Now my program is solid, right? Well, unfortunately, said customer XYZ comes in and says, wait, 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 wait. We want to save the configuration information before you exit. You can't just stop right there. <laughs> Once again, moving requirements on us. All right. Well, let's go ahead and code that in. All right. So now what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and not only in queue exit at the front, but we're going to in queue save at the front of it. But I have one question for you. Does anybody know which order I'm supposed to in queue those things? And I'll try to see what happens in your program. Save and then exit. OK, so that, that's, that's right? OK. Wait, why isn't it right? If there's things inside of the queue, it's going to put save and then exit. Oh, no, that's right. It needs to be the other way, right? And then you need to exit and then save. Well, wait, wait. OK, so let's go ahead and try that. So there seemed to be a general consensus. I'm sorry you're the minority in this case. <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, kick it over there. So we've got a room full of lab UR experts, and that was the answer. He's the only one that knows better than the rest of you. <laughs> so we're going to go, oh, oh, he's doing that. There we go. So, so I'm just going to go ahead and stop my program, right? Wait. It's not saving when I hit exit. So let's go ahead and see if it works the other way. Two, three, let's go ahead and stop. Ah, saved. Perfect. So what's the problem? Can anybody identify the problem? Aaron? Timing. timing. What's the problem with the timing? Depending upon whether the bottom the queue, bottom is I know you don't Yeah, yeah, so it's okay. Sheet. It's okay. Whether the queue, whether the, the function or if it's still a executing idle. a state. Exactly. And so now my program has this problem of Identity crisis. What mode is it in? I don't know. Am I some angstful teenager? Am I some... Uh, anyways, I don't have to Continuing forward from there. The basic idea is, yes, my action queue, depending on whether it's empty or not, needs to, uh, doesn't know which one to queue in front. So now we, there's, it's almost a unsolvable problem without stepping to something even more elaborate than these basic concepts that we've got. Each one of these things are problems that I'm sure anybody that's done this design has run into and patched over or tried to code around on a regular basis, if not once or multiple times starting out. So hopefully everybody agrees that there are some problems with the bridges that we designed. So let's talk about this idea a little bit before I continue forward. Functional Play-Doh. For those of you who have seen other presentations that I've done where I talk about s'mores, the idea of creating things that are scalable modular, reusable, extensible, and simplified, my five core tenants that I program everything to. Functional Play-Doh has to do with modularity. Very often in people's programs, they don't keep functionality of the program separated by any clear lines. So the, way, the reason why I have Play-Doh up on the screen is that this is what the company Play-Doh Incorporated would have us believe that children will create. And if I ever needed to use red to create one of those things, guess what I do? Well, I just nicely pull that red off the front of my mupa down there, and I make a schmoo down there, and uh, everybody's happy with it. But unfortunately, what is the reality is that uh, although the girl back there is extremely happy with her little creation, this is what happens to our code. We take things like uh, event handling and error handling and display management and flow control and we mix them all together and we got this functional blob. Now how easy is it to debug that thing? I don't know if I would want to try to debug it. So what we must do is exercise the evil within. We must take an idea of our progress and separate this evil twin 
off of us. Now, why is an evil twin? The problem ends up being is we actually have the essence, <laughs> much like he has the essence of evil there, uh, the essence of a state machine inside of all of our programs. All of our programs have some mechanism of flow. It's not a matter that our programs just sit there and they don't run. They do stuff. It just happens to be that there's not an even, even a graphical way to easily represent it because the flow control is in every single one of our actions. Any action that you can enqueue to this action queue from any other place has got to be capable of being smart enough and having brains inside of an action that's meant to acquire data from a DAT card or to uh, write something to file. And also, this action has to not only do its own action, but also handle the flow of the program. Well, let's separate the evil twin and make it a good sibling. You can even see that it is a nice transition from pink to green. It is a whole thing. So, uh, but now it's a good idea. So let's go ahead and separate. Let's take our minds for a second, melt them some, and separate this idea of putting the flow logic of the program inside of our actions and pull it out. Let's functionally contain it so that we can now better control it and understand it. Getting goosebumps, I love the one that happens, and it's a good idea. Okay, so for all of us, as we start to do this, you say, okay, Norm, show me what to do. How do I even get started down this part of exercising the evil within my program? First idea is get it out of your heads that actions are states. States are modes of your program. Is my program idle? Is it recording? Is it playing back? Is it monitoring? Is it shutting down? These are states of being of your program. They are not individual actions. If, now, granted, I'll make a quick concession. There are different ways of representing a state machine where an individual action is represented as a state. And some, uh, it is valid for some people to think about it that way given their individual implementation. That being said, we are so twisted in our minds that we have got to break the cycle of thinking of states as actions. We need to break that way of operating and say, no, states are modes of my program. So I want to write a program. What's the first thing I do? I say, what are the modes of my program? I'm going to call them states. Triggers now. I'm no longer sending individual items into my action queue. I have the essence of triggers separate from actions. Triggers cause stimulus inside of my program. And then, now that I have my states and my triggers, now I have to start linking them together and I say, what is the behavior of a given state? What's the brain of this state to say, I'm in this state, I've received this trigger, now what do I do? I functionally contain that to its own piece. Once again, Based off of this, now states are no longer actions. Actions only happen on transitions. Remember that diagram I had up there earlier, where we draw it at the beginning, at an end, and states had transitions. That is where our actions happen. If we were to envision an execution highlight of that diagram, we wouldn't see anything happen at the state. Actions would be happening as we moved along that individual transition there. And triggers cause transitions to the system. So I'm in a state, I get a trigger, I do a transition. A quick note, no trigger happening is an idle transition. Because sometimes in an idle state, or not, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> sometimes when we're in a state, yeah, I'm still trying to do that to myself too. Uh, sometimes when we're still in a given state and nothing happens, we want to go ahead and perform some action. Do a watchdog check of something. Or go ahead and update the UI with maybe the next time or something that's that effect. So once again, please make me happy, everybody all together. Actions only happen on transitions. What the? Actions only happen on transitions. Kool-Aid's outside. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> and the state is not in action. So let me show you a very brief use case of this. Perfect. So what we're looking at here is my representation of a very simple program that has four given states. Idle, shut down, connected, and sweeping. So I'm going to zoom in. Let's um, no, enough. Let's go ahead and move this around just a hair. And let's do that. So I don't. 
don't know if anybody can see all of this in the back. Is the text still pretty blurry in the black back? Still pretty, okay, that's fine. Well, I'll talk through it a little bit. But what we have here is the sweeping state. And what can you tell me? What can somebody identify about this state? Yep, it has, a, oh, no, not, well, not necessarily. It has a transition out of it. So the two things I was looking for, but it does repeat, it does continue, but it also transitions out of itself. And so remember, transitions are caused by triggers of the system. And then it only is entered from a different state. And so there's actions that happen here, actions that happen there, and actions that happen there. This individual transition is the more points to process. And so when all of a sudden I get into this state, I go to the logic of it. And it says, so it gets there. It determines through its own brain, I've got more points to do. And I start to stop the generator sweep increment, da, 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 goes through all the actions that are necessary. When it's done, it goes back into sweeping. And guess what it does? It processes the logic of the flow. And it makes sense, right? We've modularized the flow of my program into this state machine now. This is where the logic happens. And so once I get back into here, guess what I check? Do I have more points to process or do I have no more points to process? If I'm finally done with no more points, I stop generation, start, do, 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 and I move back to my uh, individual, um, the previous state that I was actually in. Any questions so far? Can you say that one more time? It's a, he's asking kind of how is it different than in the past. I don't see how you implement your triggering state of the state of the program and action happens So you look show me the code. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. We're gonna get there. And you're absolutely right to ask. And so there are other ways and there's more information that is kind of not visible on this diagram because to try to show all the different things associated with the given transition, this would get too cluttered at this point for the purpose of the presentation. But I'll show you on a lab block diagram in just a second. So, for those who here has heard of top level baseline, or TLB? So, we got a smattering about the crowd. Thank you for being brave enough to raise your hands. Hopefully, you like it. It's a creation, uh, it's a template actually that I created based off of, da -da -da -da, surprise, surprise, a cute message handler. And I've used it since about 2004-ish, 2003-ish. And so I've created, much like you, swaths of programs based off this design that I say has problems in it. But it's that I haven't been doing this thing for a long time. It just hit me like a brainstorm the other day. But this is the basic idea. So when I show the example code, you're going to see this section over the left, which is just like basic application initialization, basic application close down, closing references. This is an event handler loop that exists on top that typically would used to in queue other actions in. And then this is the, the what we used to call the lab view state machine um, inside of here where it used to have all the individual actions. So this is what I propose. This is my own prep preposition in terms of how this design can change. You have your primary execution loop, which is going through doing what it needs to. But we have this other section immediately next to it, which represents the state machine in the code. Does that kind of make sense? Does that make no sense? Raise your hand and say, you've got to go through that again. It doesn't make sense. Nothing? I got a head scratch over there. It's close enough. Show you the code. All right. Well, let's go and show you the simple case. Go back to our very basic action one, two, three, four, five. So, what we're looking at is what we had previously. An individual event processor up top, an action handler down in the bottom. One of the things that you can notice right now is one big difference is I have a secondary queue of the system. It ends up being extremely important to this idea of transitioning over to actually have a secondary queue, which is not your action queue. We like the idea of having queued up actions. It allows us to have this case structure with all these actions inside it so we can see our actual the guts of our program, where the flow used to be part of it. 
But if we want to have this idea of triggers not being part of this actual actions, we need to have a secondary queue, which is now the recipients or the firer or the keeper of keys when it comes down to triggers. And then there's this portion over here. This is a very simple program. It says startup and shutdown, processing and idle. This is my representation of that very simple program that we had up on the screen. One, two, three, four, five, and then stop. And so now it starts up, it immediately does enough things, does actions on its way to going to idle, and then it sits there at idle. And once it's idle, this transition represents stay in idle. Idle, idle. Now it doesn't go, you know, once every millisecond, you know, it's throttled, but it's just if there's any actions that need to happen in the idle, it stays there. Then if somebody hits a button or the system trigger, it does the transition down into processing. And then processing sees that there is inside of its trigger queue, I need to start processing. And guess what happens? One, two, three, four, five, and it goes back to processing. It looks at the trigger queue. If nobody's hit start again, then it just goes ahead and it transitions back to idle and it sits there. If at any point in time it goes back to the processing, it's done with all of its actions, and now it goes to the processing section, well, go ahead and look, see what triggers are in the system. If there's another trigger in the system to go ahead and do one, two, three, four, five, go ahead and do that again. The way that that's represented down below here, it's like this. So I have, I have now finally, my program truly has a state of the program, represented by an enumeration. Now this is just, a, I've got a better example that's more fleshed out, this is just the zoomed in for what we've worked on. So, but my program now truly has statefulness awareness, it is finally conscious of what state it's in. And now there is actually a case structure that has the state in it, which goes ahead and does the logic for flow for that given state. At that point in time, once I'm now processing, you can imagine like once I get inside this structure, I'm actually in that node of diagram. So what do I do? Well, I can do a couple different things. In this program, since there's no external stimulus or there's no variables of the program, really, um, all I do is I look at my trigger queue. And for those of you who can see, I'm sorry for those who can't at the moment, we have none, start sequence, save data, and close application. So nothing's happened, somebody's hit start sequence, somebody hits save data, or somebody hits close program. So now I can determine what my program is supposed to do based on stimulus. I don't have to go through all my actions and figure that out. It's all here in this chunk of code. And so if I'm in the uh, processing, a processing state, and somebody in queues the start sequence, guess what I do? One, two, three, four, five. Now one of the things that this had that looks very similar to what we had before is, remember I had this very same idea. I hit the start button, it in queues all the individual things. Well what happened? If you hit the start button 20 times, you couldn't really get in front of everything. You couldn't stop it at that point in time. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. But now, one of the key things about this program is we're only in actions from this part of the code, and that is so critical. It's so critical because what we used to do is we used to have an action, which used to queue another action, which queued other actions, queued other actions, and it would just go on and on and on forever. Now, granted, we're smart. We programmed it wise so that it actually did what it needed to, but it also caused the problems. Now, this is the sole place, only a state is allowed to in queue more actions. Because that's where the intelligence is. You've programmed the flow of your program based on the state model. And based on a given trigger or other variables of the program that moves forward. Now one of the interesting things, and this is really going to melt your mind, so I'm sorry for those of you who are already on the edge. Who, who's, who's already kind of like melted mind here? Yeah, Come on, don't be afraid. Me? Oh, apparently I'm the only one. Yes, yeah, I've got to actually, I've got a better diagram that's better documented. But this is the state. These are the triggers. The two side by side. Yes. Sorry, the main overlay diagram. Okay, hold on. Let's go ahead and back up out of this. Yeah, 
Uh, actually, I can just show you the lab and do that whole set. So that's the top and bottom, the event handler loop, or the primary execution loop. And then this individual case structure is for processing actions or messages, if you wanted to keep it that way. And then this one is handles the system states. Now there's one uh, case structure on the outside of that that, don't forget, we're still inside this larger loop and I'll get to, uh, where we're doing action, 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 action. We don't want to process the state logic after every action, but we still, in lab view, want to keep this familiar look and feel of having this loop where every iteration of the loop is a new action. And so this outside one, it actually looks at the transition. Only once the transition is complete, does it then go and say, now what am I supposed to do? And so this is just a basic flag, this structure that's around the outside. For reference, this is going to be available as uh, a template, an example, and then ideally in a few days a VI package that you can all install as well. But once you've finished the transition, you've hit that arrowhead, you are now back in a state. At, and now it's time to figure out what to do. Then we actually say, well, which state am I in? And then I actually look at the application to see the triggers. Does that clarify? Okay. This goes to sort of. Uh, Will this go to quarter after? Yeah. Just about. All right. Well, I could go on about a variety of features and the design decisions behind this. Um, I would love to talk to anybody who thinks that this is the way that they want to go to talk about a lot of the design decisions behind it, because there are a lot of little nitty-gritty things like why is that over there like that, and um, you know why have you routed that action queue around the outside? But you'll notice one of the big differences here. This no longer is wired in, right? I no longer allow an action to enqueue another action. I've explicitly coded it out in this. I'm sure you could code it back in if you really wanted to, but that was for the purpose of saying actions are only enqueued via state logic. And well, yeah, that's the. So. so why even go down this route? First one, ease of documentation. Only through the usage of a variety of flow charts have I ever seen anybody take a queued message handler and try to declare what the flow of the program was actually supposed to be. And imagine how hard it is in a flow chart to try to put something else in there to kind of say, well, yes, no, this value, that value, that value. The flow charts aren't very good at documenting the actual state machine of a program. And so if you kind of transition to this idea of states are modes of the programs, there are triggers to the system, and actions only happen along transitions, you now get the ease of being able to represent your program as a state machine diagram. Functional containment, no more Play-Doh code. Now and only now is it or can you actually look at a single piece of your application, and then through there try to determine what's supposed to happen. And you can link that, as you saw in my diagram, you've got an actual picture of the state machine and then the actual implementation of it. And you can kind of say, okay, how is my program supposed to work from here? So we functionally contain the flow of the program. If there's a problem with the flow, you know where it resides. If there's a problem with your DAT card not connecting, you know where that resides. They aren't in the same place. Reuse of actions. And so in this idea of the queue message handler, we've got this stack of actions that are available to us, things that we can actually execute. Well, the problem ended up being is because the flow used to be cooked into every action, if you were in a different mode of your program and you wanted to reuse an action, let's just say it's save data. Let's just say you're logging the disk and every so often you just want to save data off. And it used to be save data only worked while your program was idle. But now you want to have it call this individual action again. Well, before the idle, uh, I guess, state of your program, the implicit idle, the save data used to work fine, but now that you're doing it while the program's running, it doesn't work. So now you have to very explicitly, inside your save data action, go ahead and put extra logic in there to handle it being called from different modes of operation, as opposed to the flow of the program enabling that. So now we can reuse a given action without having to worry about the flow. 
This goes to the robustness of the program from externally or unexpected inputs. The, the use case that I brought up originally was me you know, button mashing at inappropriate times. Well, now if you define the flow of your program based off of, once well, I the state machine, it's not going to get unexpected triggers unless you fail to actually program that in. Also, uh, robustness of the program. So now as, uh, as all of us as Labview developers get more and more, more and more of us are developing these asynchronously running nodes of an application, kind of constituting the whole application. Individual pieces are taking external input. The application isn't responsible for just running itself and everything underneath the tire. And so the problem is, is that if we write a program and we don't want somebody to button mash at the wrong time, what do we, what do, we do? Anybody? Scott Romine? Scott Romine in the house. What do we do? Disable the control. Disable the control. Right? So that'll stop anybody from hitting that button and we won't have a problem anymore. But what? Dis disable the mouse. But <laughs> I didn't think of that one. <laughs> but what about the scenario when all of a sudden we've got this thing and we want it automated as well? We've created this great UI, but it needs to be able to automate from external. Well, now all bets are off. You can't stop these things from coming in. You can receive them, and then you have to handle them appropriately based on the state that you're in because you got a hey, that sounds just like what we were saying we should do in the first place anyway. So once again, the external triggers. This also helps that process. Stability of the program after modification, this is a huge one. So all of us build our own bridges. We know how to walk across them. Now if there is a diagram and a flow of the program that's been defined, now you have the ability to have somebody else walk into your program and they have a place to look. I need to add functionality to this program. Can I just start calling these actions all over the place and hope it works okay? No, the very first thought is, how do I fit into the flow of the program? A graphical data flow. Data flow is our lives for those of us that live and breathe lab. So the idea is that now if they think, how am I going to fit into here, and they follow the idea that actions happen on transitions and states aren't actions, there's a higher likelihood that the program isn't going to go into an unstable state because of some change that they made. Error handling. Very often in these queued message handlers, we have one individual action called error, right? And the best, that, the worst that most, or the the less, the least that most of us do, is we put a general error handle in there and we pop open the error and we allow a person to stop or continue the program. If we get a little bit better, we actually look at the error code and then we handle that error code appropriately, right? What do I do with it? My program's a little bit more robust than that. But the problem is, is that you can get a file I/O error from a variety of parts of your program, can't you? <coughs> You can get your file I.O. error in different modes of your program. If you're monitoring a signal and you're just looking at it, is it okay if an error pops up on the screen? Yeah. Probably, you're sitting in front of it, you're just looking at it. What about if you're recording high-speed streaming a disk? Do you want that to still happen? No, you want the error handling to be cognizant of the error or the state of the program. Or the other way to look at it is the state of the program is now in charge of appropriately handling errors for that. Stateful display and behavior. This is the very idea that spawned this entire mental melting that I've done for myself. I was looking at a UI, and somebody was hitting start, and they were doing monitoring, and they were recording, and they were doing different things like this. And at each different thing that he would do, it would change buttons, and it would do these individual things. So that very action, somebody doesn't click stuff at the wrong time. And it struck me, this is, these are states of the program. Well, now we can also functionally contain. Get rid of the Play-Doh for, you know, just get rid of it. Now we have a functional place where we can actually say, given a state of the program, I have a case structure, state in, now I've set the display appropriately for that given mode. And lastly, the biggest thing, based on the design of the template that I showed a little bit earlier that I'm willing to share, that I'm going to share, is a familiar programming paradigm. There's uh, the LabVIEW state chart module which is a very, uh, very novel and very good tool that NI has. Uh, it doesn't fit the model that I like to use, and I think that it probably, for those of you who don't use it and maybe have checked it out, it might not work for you either. But it still has the same good concept of having statefulness of a program moving from state to state to state and having actions happen. But the problem is we, we lose this cute message handler that so many of us are just, and so many of the new people are just now getting used to being to using. The ability to hold down scroll and move through your actions of your program so you can see what happens, as opposed to going into sub-BIs and out of sub-BIs for every individual action in the program. 
So the benefits of going this route, based on what I've shown, is it helps preserve that. There are some caveats to this uh, with interrupting actions, updating controls and indicators. It's not that these aren't possible. It's that things get a little bit more, um, you know, before you used to just kind of ignore it and cram another action in there, you need to put a little bit more thought into some of these things. And then also the idea of a full, this is kind of interesting. I, I put this in here originally without realizing what I was saying. A fully fleshed out program is going to have a very kind of detailed, you know, lots of possible states to the program. You know, even if it's like 10 individual states. So you're going to have a lot of wires going around, but at least you've got the diagram at that point. The reason that... Oh, I'm going to say flush. <laughs> There's a question, should it be fleshed out or flushed out? Um, I think it depends on how, how, how clean you think the diagram is. <laughs> should it be flushed out or fleshed out? Um, but the idea ends up being is the reason that this never existed before, and we ne I never thought about this before, we're not transitioning from something that used to be good to something that's now this large thing of states and transitions between them. We never had anything before. We never had a good way to actually represent the flow of our program. And so maybe there's other ways and other tools that we can use to help show LabVIEW and State Machine, Cube Message Hamlet and State Machine working together in one program as opposed to just being a state machine, which if you go to new dot 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 in LabVIEW, there's a LabVIEW state machine. It's very, very simple. It doesn't meet a lot of our case needs. And there's a cute message channel. It meets a lot of our case needs, but unfortunately it has the, the um, problems that we were talking about earlier with the bridge. Now the idea is they're going to exist together. Um, real quick, tools, visual paradigm is what I was showing up there on the screen. Visio, DS, star UML, and my state chart module are all things that are available to us to help in the process of diagramming. And then there's um, other ideas for the program where I'd actually integrate an active representation of the state machine onto the block diagram using an Xnote, for those of you who know what it is. An OO based implementation for framework. Uh, talk about the active framework and then tools for viewing actions as sub BIs. That's what you were actually seeing me use um, a little bit earlier with. Uh, Oh, that right there. So this is the idea. I've got a bunch of sub BIs, and I am actually going through the process of looking at each of them in a different diagram. So there's a couple uh, notes of those tools and ideas. So we are almost. Uh, oh, that's all right. Is there anybody? There we go. So quick plug, there's a happy hour that's apparently happening with the Alliance Partners uh, afterwards today, and then there's individual contact information. Uh, and does anybody have any questions on this? On the back. What's the name of that tool Oh, that one? Yeah. Let's see, where did I put that here? It's a little tool that I created called Quick View. And it actually allows you to select a bunch of things in a project, hit load selection, and then uh, the controls. And then just move through them. And then also it has, so it's something I created. It's actually my example for the implementation of the LabVIEW rebirthed state machine. So if you like that tool, you're going to have to get used to using this, because now that's how it's built in the back. Yes. 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 So he was asking about the simple, the, the, the simple state machine that's in LiveView, where the state is actually held in a shift register. It's just sent to the next iteration, right? And so that's how it figures out what to process next. And where does that actually exist in the program? Because now I've got all these queues. Well, if you notice, I'm not actually in queuing the state. That other queue that I have is my trigger queue. So I'm actually saving my state in a shift register. It just happens to be right there. I just have now the data space of my program is held within this, um, uh, I guess some people call it the mother cluster up front. There's a couple different ways to put it. But inside of this data space 
one of the things that I have there is the idea of, zoom in for those of you in the back, state. So I do have that actually stored in the shift register, sent from iteration to iteration to iteration. So just verify, is there an action queue or a trigger? Yes. So the two queues for clarification, one is the action queue, which is what we used to call the state queue, and the uh, trigger queue. So yes. 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 Uh, with regards to JKI and their state machine, theirs operates, uh, it's a very good program. Uh, they have, what's that? Oh, sure. Well, this basic, oh, sorry. Do I even have this on here? I don't have this on here. No, I feel like this is 2012. I don't have it on here yet. The JKI state machine is, once again, it, for all intents and purposes, is anybody here from JKI? <laughs> wow, no one no, I can say. Fantastic. Theirs is the same kind of what I call an action engine. Now, a lot of you developers, action engine means something very different. It's a lot of you too style global with this going in and everything else. But to me, that's not an engine. That's a dynamic call based on an enumeration going into the program. There's no engineing going on What's in there. What's the official name for what you presented? TLB Prime. Well, yes. <laughs> That's more confusing. That's more it, confusing. It's, 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 it's what I, it's the Labview State Machine. In my opinion, there's a reason that the very first slide says. It's more of a state machine in the medical sense than what we were used to call the state machine before. Because that was not a state machine. Yes. Like event. Yes, before, yeah. yes, before it was just an event engine and everything else. So it might not be the most essence of a mathematical state machine that exists out there. But it's a heck of a lot closer than what we used to have, which was the state uh, that uh, Dimitri had mentioned. Was there, was there a question there? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Before your talk, I know when somebody tells me, well, the state machine of a lady state machine, okay, it's either a state machine and a UDSM. Now I have to think, is this a state machine? I've got no, so the cool thing is Demetrius' question is, you just gave me something else now I need to worry about in another bird that I need to be able to identify out there. And the fact of the matter is, yes, I, I can't go away from it, but I can guarantee you, if you get anything from RF Systems Engineering that's a top level application, it's going to be this one. <laughs> some clarification, a little bit of consolation. So the idea ends up being is, I don't, so, the only name that I have for it, you could say, is the uh, enhanced LabVIEW state machine. I can't give it any specific name, but what I do call it. Call it after the bird. It's Kiwi. There you go. We're going to start with what we have: this LabVIEW Kiwi. Uh, but in actuality, uh, let me go ahead and get over here. Uh, TLB is the original design that I had for. Um, actually, I can probably even show very quickly. So this is the original design that I had. You'll notice that there is no state uh, processing over to the side. You'll also notice that from within actions, um, I'm in queuing other actions based on something that's happening. So I'm doing that very same problem. And all that I've done, so this is TLB, top level baseline. It's available on lavag.org if you'd like to go get the old version of that. This new version will be up there as well. It's a very nice template for getting started with top level applications. Hence the name top level baseline. People get confused, they're like top base, what, huh? But no, it's a top level, it's a baseline for creating top level applications. But at the heart of it, it's just a cute, or event driven cute message handler right there. So what I've done is since really this new design is the same thing, and I didn't want to call it TLB plus because everybody would say TLB plus plus. Uh, so I called it TLB prime. And actually um, there's a different version of this one that will be up there as well that I call TLB full till. And that one there is actually oval based, if you can notice. So I've gone and replaced that shift register, that um, large mother cluster up front with the class. Other questions? Yes? Uh, is this formally described in a white paper or a sort of yeah. documentation? Because my feel is it's you have something which is perhaps a little bit more portable for us normal people than <laughs> the actor. Uh, oh, OK. Which yes. is a formal part of that you can tell. Yep. Perhaps we should ask here the audience Productizes as a formal, recommended way of doing things. Right? 
Yep. So the question was, can we make this the formal recommended way of doing everything? Well, actually, you know, uh, I'll answer that one question, then we'll wrap up real quick. So the question is, is this a formal part of LabVIEW? If not, can it be a formal part of LabVIEW? Should it be a recommendation? NRI is really, really leery sometimes of making formal recommendations of this is the way it's supposed to be done. Because you guys are engineers, architects, or engineers and scientists, and your customers are as well, and you're extremely creative. And we're, we don't presume to know how things should always be done for you. But I will say, from my own point of view, that I will make this into a sample project that will be loaded into LabVIEW 2012. So when you start up, you can use the active framework, or you can use the built-in queued message handler that is being shipped with 2012. So they do have one of these that still has the same bridge problem. But this one, uh, once you install the LabVIEW package, it will install a sample project as well. In terms of it being officially deemed you know, the way to go by NI, uh, that's what they did with the current existence of the queued message handler as it currently exists that Darren Mattinger had written. Uh, and I'm not going to necessarily say that uh, you can't do that, but I would strongly recommend making some of the very basic modifications that I've recommended to keep the program together. What about so, like when you say file new, mm -hmm. instead of just produce the consumer list? Yeah. Have you seen 2012 yet? Actually, well, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, if I go ahead. Be in that list. Uh, well, Meaningful for those of you who are on the 2012 beta, Come on, let me go quicker. In 2012, there's this new feature called the sample projects that you'll see a lot more of through the rest of NI Week and tomorrow, and we'll go from there. And uh, sorry about that. You jumped in front of me. You ruined my state flow. Yes. You did. You, you just jumped right in there. I was just processing actions left and right. You know, it didn't actually work out. Everybody's waiting for it. And so this is 2012, and then when you hit create project, you go one, two, three, four, five. Ta -da. Ta -da. Oh, not going on. No, it's not. <laughs> sure. There we go. So here is a list of individual things, uh, more fleshed out and viewing things, but like a cube mess channel, a simple state machine, active framework, and things from there. So, so that being said, any other question that continues from this point forward, you can just come on up and I'll answer afterwards. Thank you so much for your attention and everyone.